Hey, 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 this is your girl Clarissa Banner here again with This Afropolitan Life. And I'm here to tell you about um, Teju Cole's Every Day is for the Thief. It's an excellent read. It's on my 100 list, my top 100 list of books for every Afropolitan woman. It's a book about the experience um, going home. Teju Cole wrote this novel. Uh, I'm assuming it's, it's fictional. And he describes, there's a, it's an unnamed, uh, it was a remarkable read. Uh, I particularly enjoyed the theme of the novel, which was part history, part poetry. Um, and at times the prose was a bit flowery and poetic, it had poetic references in his breaks. And it was part memoir. Um, in the story, we follow this unnamed protagonist from New York City to Nigeria. Um, and we experience Nigeria with him he, on his month-long um, visit. Um, I particularly enjoyed the returnee theme of the novel um, because he was able to vocalize and label some of the um, elusive nuances uh, of home and what home means, uh, which is so peculiar to people who have who've lived in the West for a long time or were born here and just don't really know very much about home. Um, so they go there with, with their own expectations intact, you know, without kind of checking their privilege or their expectations at the door. Um, so that's why I love the novel. It was really, really descriptive and it made you really feel like you were there. He's an excellent writer. Um, I saw how he, like most of us, uh, unassumingly compared uh, Nigeria to some of the West and that's one of the things I, I noticed like that's one of the critiques I have I don't know if it was intentional and in how he wrote it but he did seem to compare um, Nigeria and the things that he saw to what he knew to be I guess the standard from the West um, kind of like uh, I'll give you some examples how he compared Nigeria's museum uh, which was definitely definitely uh, not a museum it was you know it was definitely dilapidated and could use some updates um, but he compared it to like the Louvre and, you know, the Albert and Victoria Museum in London and you know, just kind of like the bigger museums that are like the world class museums. And then he also kind of compared, he kind of um, compared and contrasted um, the Musan Music Center uh, with his decadent presentation um, to other music houses around the world. So he did give us like he, he used Western standards to describe the Nigerian experience. And that was a critique, but it was still kind of cool because it helped me as a reader see where he was coming from and what he was comparing these things to and what he was expecting from Nigeria. He also kept bringing up, there were two themes that I noticed, he kept bringing up the the importance of presentation. Like he wanted really good presentation. Like some, some of the things that he saw, he kind of accept, expected, like, you know, the marketplace and all this stuff. He expected things to be the way they were in Nigeria, but he also expected some sort of like elevated presentation. Like when he went to that jazz shop and he, you know, was like, he saw it was a stuffy, you know, jazz shop. And he thought that he can go buy some jazz records there. And apparently it was like a piracy shop where they would like, you know, they had like the main CDs, but they would burn you off a copy and that's what you would buy. Anyway, so, um, and then he went, he compared it with this other jazz shop, like really cool, um, new Africa, Africa Rising, I guess, kind of boutique where they had jazz and they had, um, they had um, books, like it was like a bookshop slash jazz shop slash, you know, kind of relax and drink some coffee type shop. And he was like, this is the kind of presentation he was talking about. Like, this is the kind of presentation that was, you know, like it was, um, it was a um, oasis and, you know, the desert that was kind of like Nigeria um, as far as these things were concerned, as far as like music and arts and creativity was concerned. He didn't see how people could create in a Nigeria that was so hard to be in, like with no lights, no water, your, your every day wasn't linear. Like you couldn't expect things to be the same on every given day. So he was like, you know, he didn't know how people created. He couldn't write there. Like he couldn't enjoy his jazz there. He couldn't really do the things that he'd like to do in New York City there. And he, he made that kind of clear. And these are all valid, um, you know, expectations and valid experiences. So um, I also noticed another theme, and that was a particularly morbid theme um, that he wove into the, that wove the chapters together. 
um, which could be really easy to miss. And I'm assuming this had to do with the title of the book, which is Every Day is for the Thief. And he said that um, in the beginning, before you delve into the book, he said this, the title was based off of a Nigerian proverb that says, every day is for the thief, oh, there's, but every, uh, it says, every day is for the thief, but one day is for the owner. And it's a Yoruba, a Yoruba proverb, proverb. And I'm assuming that has to do with like the way Nigeria is, where there's, every day is a hustle, but uh, the one day you win, kind of like, like that. And so one of the, I think the morbid thing that he presented in the book that was really, really like subtle was in reference to that. I may be wrong, but that's what I got out of it. Like every chapter ended with someone dying or um, you know, there was an occurrence of death, you know, there was always a story or a memory of someone dying, like his dad or his uncle or his, you know, that, that woman who was in, at the funeral who had, whose husband had died by, from, by armed robbers. And there was just always, there was this constant fear in his book when he was describing a robbery scene when his aunt had brought some stuff in from a shipment and how the area boys would follow the shipment from the ports <laughs> and come rob you. Um, so he, I'm assuming that he was really, and he really did a really good job of describing the terror of like of everyday life, of just like uns the unsettledness, not terror, but the unsettled, the unsettledness of living a hustle life in in the streets of Lagos and Abuja and all these places. Um, and there was even like a, a, a even his mom who wasn't dead, but was dead to him because he didn't really have a relationship with her. That was also kind of like a death too so I mean that's one of the themes I noticed I might be wrong um another thing about this book yo was the history and you know I'm, I'm a I'm an avid history I'm an avid story collector I love history I love African history and this book does a really good job of pointing out some historical facts that some little known historical facts and um I was particularly interested in his account of um, slavery in in Nigeria and the Delta area. He talked about how um, some uh, intertribal wars would be, you know, manufactured just so they would have people to sell off to the, you know, to the, to the slavers along the coast. And, um, you know, at 35, I think, shillings or pounds per adult male, they would, you know, they would, they would find reasons to fight and sell people. And he talked about how no one really knows about how the Delta um, was a huge, was probably the busiest slaving port in the West at that time, in West Africa at that time, because of um, the fact that the Delta is, is there's a, it's a unique port. It, it has calm waters with all the tributaries of the rivers that's flowing in. So the um, slavers didn't have to, they didn't have to, there were no old relics, you know, like Elmina Castle or Goree Island in Senegal or Amina Castle in Ghana, there were no castles, there were no forts to hold slaves because they could just birth their slavers right there in, in the port, in the Delta, and just kind of pack them in and wait there until their slavers were full and then roll out. So there were no, it, it's forgotten history. Like I, I thought that was cool. Um, that was interesting to learn about um, just that piece of history that's kind of forgotten and no one really talks about it. And he did talk about how people in Nigeria don't really interact with their history, interact with history. Um, you know, he talked about how dilapidated the museum was, the bookshops don't really have historical um, books in them, they don't stock history books outside of, um, you know, you know, uh, Willie Sonia Cut's books and maybe a few others, but they don't stock um, like a, a robust history section. Like you would go to a Barnes and Nobles here, you would go to a bookshop here, and that's another thing he compared. Like, you know, you, you would come here and you could kind of, you, you can you can thrive in the arts and literature and poetry and, and music, but they didn't have that there. And for someone who's a creative, that, that could be detrimental. You know, you don't get, you're not nurtured in that way. So children grow up and aren't really given history. There's no interaction with history. And I thought that was a pretty cool um, observation um, in this book. I was in that bookshop, he described himself and he was like looking and there was no history books and he was looking at what was available and um, he, uh, he, um, he he kind of threw some shade uh, Chimamanda's way. <laughs> he threw a little bit of shade Chimamanda's way. I don't know if it was shade, but I, I, I sensed it as, as such. Um, 
he describes Adichie because he, he noticed that uh, Chimamanda Adichie's, uh, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's um, books and Sefiata's books were stocked at that bookshop in the market. And he was he described them as um, young Nigerian women based in the United States. And they are here most likely because they have an energetic following, or uh, they have an energetic young Nigerian publisher behind them. I, I couldn't tell if that was shade, but my surroundings in that moment felt a little cooler. <laughs> yeah, I got you guys know I love my love me some Shimamanda, and that's my girl. Um, so anyway, Tejuko, I don't know if you were um, throwing shade her way, but it's all good. I understand. Anyway, um, so uh, he's a memorable writer. I will say that I like his style, and it read pretty easily. Um, you can tell he's a student of his craft, Teju Cole. I believe he's, he's a professor at a university here in the United States. He makes plenty of references to other writers and artistic greats in, in his novel, um, international um, writers and artistic greats. Um, and although his writing style is unique, it takes a bit to get used to his rhythm, um, but the novel flows once you get settled in his, his writing style. So it's a pretty cool, I would highly recommend this book to... Um, to all. Um, I added this to my top 100 list. I think the book gives a vivid description of what it's like to return home after years of um, being and knowing life somewhere else and then coming back to a place that seems incongruent with everything you know about the world. Um, so I think it's a really good book. Um, check it out. Tejuko, Every Day is for the Thief.